Hello everyone uh, and welcome to my presentation. My name is Megan Lemonas and I am a graduate student employee with Special Collections and Archives at the University of Iowa. I am a recent graduate student from the School of Library and Information Sciences. I graduated in May of 2021 with my master's um, in library science. And during my time there, I worked on um, researching the Library Fire of 1887 and looking into a collection that was donated to the library before the fire um, and figuring out where the books went after the fire has happened. So let me share my screen and we'll get started, okay? Alrighty. So today what we're going to look at is who was D.H. Talbot. Um, then we're going to look at his donation and kind of what he collected and gave to the University of Iowa before the fire. Then we'll take a look at the library fire, then the library after the fire, um, and then we'll conclude with looking at some of his books and trying to find um, those identifiers so that you guys can look uh, for them when you're in the reading room. So who was D.H. Talbot? Well, Daniel H. Talbot was born in 1850, and as an adult, Talbot became a lawyer. He moved to Sioux City, Iowa in 1870, where he began investing in land script. Now, script at that time was a legal document um, where Civil War soldiers received from the government uh, to recognize their rights to federal land that was set aside by the government. And this was also an encouragement from the government to move west. So a lot of that land was put west um, to encourage that movement. Well, Talbot devised a way around these laws uh, for him to buy and trade these land rights. From this act, he soon became very wealthy. With his wealth, Talbot invested a portion of it in real estate in Sioux City, including a farm just outside of the city. It was at this farm where he conducted breeding experiments on animals, including elk, bison, bears, wolves, monkeys, and lions. You can see in the photo on the right, right over here, um, a wanted poster where he was asking for animals, live animals that he could do more experiments on. Uh, he would pay for these animals too. So it wasn't just give me the animals. It was, I will pay you for them. Uh, Talbot also liked to travel to different countries and on these travels he would sometimes bring animals back with him that's kind of how he got a lot of the animals he did experiments on. One trip um, to Labrador Canada Talbot ended up finding a dead whale on the shore and he had that whale shipped back to him in Sioux City. However the animal was in such poor condition that when it arrived, he refused to accept it. And so the city had to get involved and there were a lot of disagreements between him and the city, not just in this case, but in a lot of other different areas too. So he's been through a lot of lawsuits um, and the, city's ha the city has had to clean up, up his messes quite a bit. Um, in the Panic of 1893, which was an economic depression in the United States that ended in 1897, Talbot ended up losing his fortune. Thankfully, before this economic depression, Talbot do donated, excuse me, his specimens to the University of Iowa Natural History Museum in his library collection to the North Hall Library in 1891. And you can still see some of his specimens today at the Natural History Museum. And you can come to Special Collections uh, to see some of his books that he donated. In 1911, Talbot died in a small shack off North Riverside. So let's take a look at some of his collection and what he kind of donated to the, uni the university. Well, Talbot donated over 4,000 volumes in 1891 with the condition that all of his books would be kept together as a collection. Now, and this was actually written in the deed um, between him and the librarian. There was a lot of correspondence you can find in his um, manuscript collection at Special Collections to those correspondence. And it is written that he wants the collection to be kept together, which it no longer is. 
because of the fire. And so in 1911, right before he died, um, he donated another 300 volumes to the library, which is interesting to see then what survived the fire and what um, he donated after, because you can see a pristine book versus one that was um, either has like color uh, discoloration from the smoke, um, water damage, or just being charred a little bit. And so you can compare and contrast those, which is really interesting. Well, his collection contained materials focusing around subjects of natural sciences, travel, history, zoology, medicine, and agriculture. Uh, the bulk of his collection in these areas is what he really focused on was from the 19th century with some of the materials printed as early as the 16th century. So really most of it was in the 19th century. And then there's a few here and there um, in earlier until the 16th century. Well, in 1893, after all of his materials were donated, the 4,000, the librarians created a ledger um, containing and marking down all of the books that he donated. So the ledger included the book titles, the authors, the number of volumes each title has, the year it was published with the publishing company, and it would also have notes on the topic it covers. So some of the notes would be, oh, this is natural sciences, this is a history book, this covers this kind of subject. And so what we are doing is we are currently transcribing this ledger, which you can see on the screen. Um, and it's all in cursive, so it is a little hard to read um, in the old print cursive because uh, it's just squished together. So we are transcribing that as best as we can um, and then moving that transcription into our databases to get call numbers to see which books survived and which ones were lost in the blaze. So we're getting a list of all of those that we've lost and that we have. Well, in 1930, Talbot's collection was the strongest collection in natural sciences, travel, and history, even though more than half of it was lost in the fire of 1897. Okay, so we've learned a little bit more about Talbot. We have an understanding of who he was as a person and kind of the materials that he collected for his library and what he donated. Now let's kind of understand what the library was before the fire, and then we'll look at the fire itself. So while North Hall, which you can see on the screen here, was originally constructed as a chapel, and until 1892, thousands of students and professors gathered on the second floor for services. Before the library was housed in the North Hall, it was in the old Capitol where the former Senate chamber had been, and then it moved down to the first floor on the north end in 1878. A year after that move in 1879 with its collection totaling 12,000 volumes, the State University of Iowa appointed its first full-time librarian. The library didn't move to North Hall until 1882 where it shared the second floor with the chapel. To give you guys a little context of where we are on campus, uh, North Hall stood on the Pentecrest until 1949, which you can see on the map here on the left-hand side. This is the old Capitol building. This is Clinton Street, so this is looking towards downtown. Then we've got Jefferson Street, so this is just north. Right here is North Hall, just a bit north of the old Cap, um, right where a walkway is now, so it no longer stands. Um, the North Hall, or the, excuse me, the north half of the second floor was the library stacks, which you can see on the right hand side, you can see those stacks there. And then the south half served as the chapel space and the reading room, so it shared it both. Joseph Rich, the librarian, along with Aidan North, who was another librarian during that time, made multiple requests to the Board of Regents um, after the library moved to North Hall, stating that this building was very unsafe and that they needed a library or a fireproof library building to keep their collection safe. And 
if they would have gotten this um, fireproof building, who knows what would have happened um, because after the library moved, it wasn't, it was just a few years later that the fire happened. So who knows what would have happened if that fireproof building was actually requested. Because in the early morning of June 19th, 1897, lightning struck the second, second chimney in the southwest corner of North Hall. Now, a few days before this lightning struck, there, were, there was a fireman tournament taking place in Iowa City. So fire departments from all over the state were in the area trying to compete in this tournament. The last day of the tournament was June 18th. And so that evening and night, the firemen were out celebrating the end of the tournament. So they were out drinking and just having a good time with each other. Um, and it went into the early morning of the 19th. Well, more, when word spread that there was a fire at the library after that lightning struck the corner, the fire departments rushed to campus to try to fight the blaze. However, the water pressure was too low and it did little in lowering the flames. Now, back then there was also some controversy on this too, because some people like citizens um, of Iowa City were concerned and stated that if the firemen weren't out uh, celebrating the end of the tournament, um, more probably would have been saved and they could have gotten there sooner because they weren't then under the influence. However, we still, we don't know if that was the case um, because like I said, the water pressure was too low. So there's a lot of factors into play and we just, we don't know what would have happened um, if that tournament wasn't there or if they weren't celebrating, there's just a lot of factors at play. During the fire, uh, the reference librarian, Miss Mary E. Barrett, along with three firemen, went into the blaze through a second floor, second story window to save the accession records and some of the books. One firefighter, Mr. L. M. Leak, tried to save um, the card catalogs when part of the ceiling collapsed on him and he ended up losing his life. As an article stated in the Daily Iowan from 1949, in about three hours, the largest and most comprehensive library in the state was reduced to 4,500 volumes. The remaining books after the blaze settled down were removed to a church basement nearby. And then once the building was secure and ready to hold the library again, they moved back to North Hall where they stayed until a new building was completed in 1951. This North Hall building was demolished in 1949. And you can still see some of the bricks um, today. They were used around campus and some of the other buildings. So that's a fun little scavenger hunt for you guys to do. Now, after the fire, a letter was sent to Talbot uh, from the librarian at Iowa, letting him know that there was a disaster uh, at the library and that more than half of his collection was burned. Talbot responded, which you can see on the screen, um, that what he has long feared has come to him in a telegram today. He continues talking about the shock and how he is happy that he has some of his books yet with him in Sioux City. And then later on in his letter, Talbot talks about how a fireproof building is needed um, for the future of the library to be able to continue to hold all the treasures within. So now after the fire, his books have been dispersed between many libraries on campus. Some of Talbot's books are in special collections. Some are in the main library. Some are at our offsite storage facilities and others may be in different departments on campus um, or in other little campus libraries, <clears throat> excuse me. And without the ledger documenting Talbot's collection, it's really hard to know um, what his books are and where to start searching for them. But once you find one or two of them, you can kind of get an idea of what you're looking for. Now, most of Talbot's books were rebound into a basic library binding. A lot of it was like a brownish um, plastic binding, so it's not the original. Um, and you can easily spot those 
on the stacks because they don't look like an original book anymore. They were rebound. So that's a really good indicator that it's going to be a Talbot book. The second way to look for them is there are three different um, identifications within the book to let you know if it's Talbot. The first is that Talbot has his own book plate. You can see that on the image in the left hand side. It says the library of D.H. Talbot, Sioux City, Iowa. So some of his books will have that book plate within it on the front cover, excuse me, on the inside of the front cover. So if that is there, then you know it's a Talbot book. If that is not there, another good way to look is going up top on the same left hand side image, um, you can see the State University of Iowa library book plate. And where it says on that book plate up top, it says botany right up here. Sometimes it'll be handwritten um, that it just says Talbot. So then you know that it's a Talbot book too, because it says it right there on that book plate even if it doesn't have the um, D.H. Talbot book plate underneath it, it's still a good identi identification um, of that book. So we've got two on the front, on the inside of the front cover. Well, if those aren't there, then you need to go to the um, title page of the book, which you can see on the right hand side. There's a stamp that says owned by D.H. Talbot, Sioux City, Iowa, and it's in a purpley color. Well, almost all of his books are stamped with that, and some of them are very prominent, like you see on there. Some are like really faded, so you really have to just really look hard at the title page if you can't find one to see if it's faded. Now, some of his books have all three identifications. Some have two, some have one, and as we continue going through the stacks and looking, some have none of them. And so that's where we really have to trust the ledger and look at the title, the author, the publication, the dates, and just really do some more research on the book to see if it is a Talbot book or not. Now moving past identifications of book plates um, and stamps, another good indicator to see if it is a Talbot book is looking for burn marks, smoke discoloration, and water damage. Excuse me. Not all of his collection, though, will have this. We'll look at that a little later. Um, and especially since there's 300 volumes that were donated after the fire, those are not going to have any of um, these damages on them. But if it fits within his collecting period and it's not stamped, you are able to kind of determine if it is his or not, or that it was within this fire probably um, because of the flame and the scorch marks or the water damage. So this one in particular is called A Flora of North America. That's the book you see on the screen now. And you couldn't tell it was burned until you opened it up and you flipped it over and looked at the back because all of these burns happened on the back. They're not on the front. Well, this book does actually have a rebound um, spine. It is, it does have a stamp. So we knew for sure that it was a Talbot book. But without that, um, having it being rebound, it's in the same area that he collected um, for both subject matter and time period. But it also, has those scorch marks. So we were able to check off a lot of um, boxes to make to see if it is a Talbot book. But having that stamp for sure is really a good indicator saying that it is his. And not all of his books have these scorch marks. Let's go back. So you can see here, some are just like the corners are gone, um, but we'll flip forward. And some are just little nicks. You can see right here on the right hand side that it's just a little nick for a scorch mark. It's not the whole thing. Um, pages aren't missing. It's just a tiny little burn mark in the corner of the fold out. So it's not burned like the others, but knowing that it had a little bit and it fit the time period, we knew that we were looking at something that probably was in the fire of 1897. And 
having that identification of the stamp um, on the title page let us know that it was a Talbot book. So there are just a lot of factors at play here to have you identify which book is a Talbot and which one is not. And relying on that ledger uh, the librarians made in 1893 is really the key thing that we'll have to use um, to continue identifying the books in the future. So before we end today, um, if you would like to know more about Talbot's collection in the Library of Fire of 1897, please check out my online exhibit. Uh, this shares more information about his materials um, and the scientific value his collection has. I just went through a little brief explanation about it all, but if you go to my online exhibit, you will be able to see more um, and learn more about Talbot and look at more of his books. Um, we just saw a snippet, but there's a lot more. I just wanna let you know, there's a lot more on the exhibit. Um, and the exhibit, like I said, it shows more materials, but it also shows videos um, kind of paging through some of his items too. So that way you can have a little more interactiveness with his materials and see more pages than the pictures that I present to you. There is also a video explaining some of his first editions. Um, there's one first edition in particular that we talk about um, and that video is presented by a curator of rare books and maps, Eric Ensley. You can find the exhibit on the University of Iowa Library's Special Collections webpage, um, and it will be released hopefully in the next few weeks here. Before we end today, I have just a few people I would like to thank uh, who have helped me throughout my research. Thank you to Kara Logston, who supported my research project throughout the practicum class at the School of Library and Information Sciences at the University of Iowa. She was always so thrilled and excited to hear what I have um, discovered throughout the weeks um, and just kept egging me on and knowing that um, I could go to her if needed and if I ever hit a standstill in my project, she was always there for me. Lindsay Moen and Eric Ensley deserve such a huge thank you. They were the ones I turned to when problems arose. They were constantly keeping an eye out of tab for tablet books as they managed their different work th workflows throughout their day-to-day -day, um, tasks at special collections. I kept getting a lot of text messages um, and emails from the two of them with just the title page and a call number, and it made me excited to go back into work just so that I could look at it myself and see uh, what the book was and how it was in a format. If it was smoke discolored or water damaged or whatever, they just made me more eager to come back and continue researching. But they were also the ones that I shared my discoveries with. Uh, when I found a ledger, instant message uh, to Eric letting him know that this exists and that we've made a huge step forward in the research. They've listened to everything that I've had on that I was going through and they're going to make sure that the research doesn't end now. We're working on more projects to continue searching for the books for other students to work on and they will continue looking for Talbot books um, now that they've got an eye for it. I couldn't have done all of this without their support. And thank you to my sister Morgan who helped search for the Talbot books online in the databases to Laura Michelson, project archivist at Grinnell College, and Zoe Webb, assistant preparator at the Stanley Museum of Art at the University of Iowa for helping transcribe the Talbot Ledger. To Damien Erig, curator of the John Martin Rare Book Room uh, for searching his stacks whenever I sent um, call numbers to him. I'm sure he was just so thrilled to get a message with me with a call number saying, please find and see if there's a uh, stamp on it. It always came to him on Monday. So I'm sure that was a lovely Monday thing to come to. And finally, to all the undergraduate student workers at Special Collections who I've tasked with searching the stacks for me uh, during the spring semester, it gave them a chance to see more if it was their first year there um, and just look more at the shelves and the materials, but I really appreciate all the work that they've done for me. You guys are all wonderful people, and I'm so grateful for your help in my research project. Again, thank you guys for listening to my presentation and learning more about the Library Fire of 1897. 
If you would like to learn more, please head to my online exhibit. Thank you. Have a good day.